Good afternoon, everyone. Delightful to see you all here. I'm ready to preach a sermon, 2 Kings uh, chapter 5. That's where we're going to be. If you don't know where that's at, it's after 1 Kings. Um, (laughs) That's all I can help you with. Uh, We'll go to the table of contents. 2 Kings chapter 5. I have been focusing on this text throughout the course of my sabbatical over the summer, and I want to preach out of my own study, my own time of prayer, my own observations, and uh, I I believe God has a word for us as it pertains to to how people get transformed. How do people experience healing, transformation, renewal in your own life, in relationships, across the board? How do we experience transformation? I want to give you, I think, a pathway of transformation. And so you can follow along with me on the screen. It's a, a bit of a lengthy story, so I'm going to read it, follow along on, on the screen, and there's some wonderful nuggets of truth that I'm going to extract from this story. Hear the word of the Lord. It says, now Naaman was commander of the army of the king of Aram. He was a great man in the sight of his master and highly regarded because through him the Lord had given victory to Aram. He was a valiant soldier but he had leprosy. Now bands of raiders from Aram had gone out and had taken captive a young girl from Israel, and she served Naaman's wife. She said to her mistress, if only my master would see the prophet who was in Samaria, he would cure him of his leprosy. Naaman went to his master and told him what the girl from Israel had said. By all means, go, the king of Aram replied. I will send a letter to the king of Israel. So Naaman left, taking with him 10 talents of silver, 6,000 shekels of gold, and 10 sets of clothing. The letter that he took to the king of Israel read, with this letter I am sending my servant Naaman to you so that you may cure him of his leprosy. As soon as the king of Israel read the letter, he tore his robes. Thankfully, Naaman brought 10 sets of clothes with him. You're going to see a lot of different points of humor in this text here. He tore his robes and said, am I God? Can I kill and bring back to life? Why does this fellow send someone to me to be cured of his leprosy? See how he is trying to pick a quarrel with me. He's trying to pick a fight with me. When Elisha, the man of God, heard that the king of Israel had torn his robes, he sent him this message. Why have you torn your robes? Have the man come to me, and he will know that there is a prophet in Israel. So Naaman went with his horses and chariots and stopped at the door of Elisha's house. Elisha sent a messenger to say to him, go wash yourself seven times in the Jordan, and your flesh will be restored And you will be cleansed. But Naaman went away angry and said, I thought that he would surely come out to me and stand and call on the name of the Lord his God, wave his hand over the spot, and cure me of my leprosy. Are not Abana and Farpar, the rivers of Damascus, better than all the waters of Israel? Couldn't I wash in them and be cleansed? So he turned and went off in a rage. Verse 13. Naaman's servants went to him and said, My father, if the prophet had told you to do some great thing, would you not have done it? How much more then when he tells you, wash and be cleansed? So he went down and dipped himself in the Jordan seven times, as the man of God told him, and his flesh was restored and became clean like that of a young boy. Verse 15, then Naaman and all his attendants went back to the man of God. He stood before him and said, now I know that there is no God in all the world except in Israel. So please accept the gift from your servant. Let's pray together. Lord Jesus, you long to transform our lives, to heal, to renew, to give us a different kind of future. Lord, teach us what it looks like to surrender ourselves to the work of your spirit. We pray this now in Jesus' name. And everyone said, amen. Amen. The pathway of transformation. All of us in this room long for transformation. We long for healing. 
We long for renewal. When we look at our lives, when we look at our relationships, when we look at our sick bodies, when we look at our finances, when we look at the world, we long for transformation. We long for healing. We long for renewal. And what often happens is in our yearning for transformation, we get to a point where we are so desperate that we open ourselves up to God's work in our lives. And so said this way, it is often desperation which precedes transformation. Desperation often precedes transformation. And when we gather together as the people of God every Sunday, week in and week out, we are faced with desperate situations. We are faced with desperation. For some of us, we are desperate for a job, desperate for a healing, desperate for a relationship to be restored, desperate for direction in our lives. Have you ever been desperate for something? Ever felt the pain of desperation in your life? Desperation often precedes transformation. Desperation reveals the level of our powerlessness that we often experience. And you can tell whether someone is ready for transformation by how serious they are of following through with their moments of desperation. Consequently, you can see someone who is not open to transformation by how far they are willing to not go in their moments of desperation. My children from time to time will say to me, I'm so hungry, I'm so hungry, I'm starving, I'm desperate for food. And I say, well, first of all, they just ate like 30 minutes ago. But, 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 but I say, you know, there's some broccoli, there's some carrots. And they go, no, 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 I'm good, I'm, I'm good. You're not desperate, you're not desperate. <laughs> because if you were really desperate, the broccoli would taste good. If you were really desperate, you'd go for the carrots. They're not really desperate. What they want is transformation. They want their longings to be met in their own way. And this is what happens with transformation. We often want transformation in a way that we can control it. We want, a tra we want transformation, but, but we want to be the people who determine how, when it happens. And this is what we see in this text. We see a man who is longing for transformation... He is also desperate, but he wants to control the means of his transformation. And all of us, when we gather together, we are faced with very serious circumstances in our lives. We're desperate to, to get over our sexual addictions. We're desperate to get over the financial struggles we face. We're desperate to get over the, the strain of human relationships we experience. The question is, how far are you willing to go? How open are you to the presence of God who longs to transform whatever you're faced with today. This is where we come to our text today, where we see a man who's desperate, but he still wants to be in control. In 2 Kings chapter 5, we come across a man named Naaman. And what we see in this man is this man has got it together. At least he looks like he's got it together. He's the general of the, uh, of the land, the country of Aram. He leads armies. He's a powerful man. God has given him victories. He, he inspires people. He leads people. He gives direction. He, he takes initiative. This is a man who everyone respects, everyone reveres, lots of friends on Facebook, tons of followers on Twitter. I mean, this guy has got it going on. But the story says that he's a general, he's done many great things, he's a great man in the sight of his master, highly regarded, but he has leprosy. Great man, powerful, strong, wise, but he has leprosy. And this is an important uh, detail in this story because it tells us something about Naaman. It tells us something about our own lives. That is to say that everything can look good on the outside, but you have leprosy. Leprosy was this skin disease that, that would often run its course over, over 30 years. And throughout the 30 years, the more serious it got, entire uh, fingers would fall off, toes would fall off, entire limbs would fall off. It's a skin disease that, that brought about tons of physical pain, a lot of emotional distance and, and marginalization that came because of this skin disease. And so here Naaman is on the outside, he looks powerful, but on the inside, he's broken. He's hurting. He's wounded. And all of us 
on the outside might look good, but for many of us on the inside, we're broken and hurting and wounded and stuck. This is why I pray the Jesus prayer every day, multiple times a day. The Jesus prayer says, Lord Jesus Christ, have mercy on me. And I need to pray this every single day, multiple times a day, because on the outside, I might look the, on the outside, I, I got a nice little red thing happening here, but beneath this, I have leprosy. Beneath our social media pictures and Facebook status updates, we, we have leprosy. There's something beneath the surface. Naaman is a man, who, he, he, he has a lot of armor, but beneath the armor, he is struggling. And so no one really knows about this except a couple of people. And so the two people who know are his wife and his wife's servant. And so I imagine Naaman would come home after a long day and his body would be aching. His skin would be irritated. They didn't have hydrocortisone cream. He couldn't go to CVS to get a prescription. And so every single day he's feeling aches and pains. We don't know how far he is in his battle with leprosy, but he's, it's enough that it's causing him a lot of pain, a lot of suffering. His wife knows about it. His wife's servant knows about it. And his wife's servant is so brokenhearted. She said, only if Naaman would go to this guy in Samaria, he's a prophet. His name is Elijah. Surely he would heal him of this disease. And Naaman, who is at this point very desperate, takes her up on this offer, has his king write a letter to the king of Israel to see what he can do for him. And it is at this point where the story gets a little bit humorous. And I want to pull it out for you. Uh, Naaman, Naaman's king sends a letter to Israel's king, and it says this. Now be advised when this letter comes to you that I have sent Naaman, my servant, to you, that you may heal him of his leprosy. The king sees this, reads that means me. You means me. And the king goes, this is a setup. And it happened when the king of Israel read the letter, he tore his clothes and said, am I God to kill and make alive that this man sends a man to me to heal him of his leprosy? Therefore, please consider and see how he seeks a quarrel with me. The king has misread the letter. You ever misread a text message? <laughs> you read something into it that wasn't there, coming to all kinds of assumptions. Every time I send a text message to someone, I like a compliment or thanks so much for doing that. And then they respond with like, thanks. And there's no exclamation point on it. And I'm like, well, excuse me. I was hoping you'd be a little bit more enthusiastic with my compliment, thanks. I wanna see multiple exclamation points. <laughs> And then we come to all kinds of conclusions about stuff. Can you, can you get me some coffee? Sure. As, you know, and, and, well, sure. Why, why, why are you more enthusiastic about getting me some coffee? And, and so we misread things. In this story, this king misreads it. He misses the context. And he jumps to all kinds of conclusions. He tears his robes. And this, this tearing must have gone viral. Someone must have been recording it with their camera because Elisha hears about it. <laughs> Multiple views in Israel of watching the king just tear his robes. And Elisha says, king, you, you, you're bugging out. Send Naaman my way. I'll show him that there is a God in Israel. And so the king sends Naaman to Elisha. And I imagine that they take, it says he comes with his chariots, his horses. This is royalty. This is power. This is strength. It's the irony. He has so much power, and yet he's so weak. He comes to the door, and I imagine Na uh, Elisha's probably in a little shack of a house. And all of these uh, chariots and horses come to this little shack of a house. And they get to the front door, and I imagine they knock on the door. And no one opens the door. And so they wait a little bit longer and they knock again. And no one opens the door a second time. They say, should we go? No, knock one more time. They knock again. And finally, the door opens. And when it opens, I imagine Naaman is waiting to see this prophet. 
that he's traveled so far to see. But when he sees the door open, he doesn't see Elisha the prophet. He sees Elisha's assistant. And the assistant doesn't say, come on in, come on in, come to the living room. I got some coffee for you. Uh, What can I do for you? We're going to talk. No, no, the assistant just doesn't say, welcome. The assistant doesn't say, good to see you. The assistant opens the door and says, "Uh, go into the Jordan River seven times, dip, you'll be okay. And Naaman is outraged. Number one, I traveled this far, and you can't even welcome me. You can't even show you. And then you're going to send your assistant who's way beneath me to give me instructions. It says Naaman begins to walk away. And in this moment, we begin to see something about transformation and how transformation works and how transformation begins. And it always begins at this point. What I'm going to tell you right now is how all transformation begins. How does it begin? It begins with Naaman laying down his need for control. And his own sense of entitlement. Naaman comes. He's used to being in control. He's used to running the show. He's used to calling the shots. Now someone is telling him what to do. And he can't stand it. You ever been in control so much that for someone to tell you something? It's like, who do you think you are telling me what to do? I do whatever I want to do. Naaman does not want to let go of control, nor of his entitlement. And transformation always comes when we let go of our need to control, of our need to be entitled. It says that Naaman became furious and turned away in a rage. And he went away and he began to say these words. He he said, I thought that he would surely come out to me, stand and call on the name of the Lord his God, wave his hand over the spot and cure me of my leprosy. First of all, Naaman must have been watching some of these these Christian shows. I thought he would just throw a jacket at me and and, and I'd be healed or, or do something along those lines. And so Naaman, he's surprised at this. But instead of him uh, just doing it, he's inviting, he's testing uh, Naaman at this moment. And what is he testing? He's saying, will Naaman be humble enough for transformation? At the core of transformation, it is, it's our willingness to be humble. It's our willingness to embrace humility. You know what humility says? Humility says, I don't take myself too seriously. You know what humility says? Humility says, I have no need to project myself as something that I am not. You know what humility says? Humility says, I have no need to be in control. Humility says, I'm open to things that are beyond my understanding, beyond my experience. I'm open to yielding myself to something I might not totally understand. But Naaman is not there yet. Humility is not thinking of less of yourself as having a correct assessment of yourself. And the assessment of ourself is this. We all need help. We all need someone who can help us. We all need someone. We we all come to an end of ourselves. Humility reminds us, I cannot do it in my own strength. I need some help. I'm reminded of one of my uh, favorite Marvel movies in Doctor Strange. And, and, and Doctor Strange is, b- before he becomes Doctor Strange, uh, 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 Sherlock and, and all that there, uh, uh, he, he's, this, he's this brilliant and uh, arrogant surgeon who, who works well with his hands. He's able to do all things. And, and, and he doesn't need anyone. He's, he's arrogant. He's proud. And there comes a moment in the film where, where he gets into a, an accident, a car accident, so much so that, and, and, and it just renders his, his hands unusual. Usable, and he can't use his hands anymore. He, he's known for the, his fingers and working, and, and, and he comes to a point where he cannot fix himself, but he still tries to fix himself. And he tries to figure out all the different ways to find healing, and he, and he keeps failing and failing, and he finds out there's some place in Nepal that if he goes to see this person, that this person can help him get healed. And he goes with his rationality. He goes with his scientific mind. He goes with having things in control, and he's invited to a different kind of reality. And the person essentially says, you're going to have to leave everything at the door what you know and open yourself up to a different dimension of reality 
to experience the transformation that you long for. And he had a hard time receiving it. But it got to a point where he was outside the door knocking, waiting, and he got to a point where he was so humiliated that it produced humility. And he waits, and the door is opened, and he enters into a different portal of reality where he can experience healing. I wonder for us, there's a new reality that God has for us if we would be open to God's ways. If we would be open to letting go of control, but Naaman is not at this point yet. He walks away in a rage. And then he's upset because the instructions are, go in the Jordan River. And Naaman protests, is there, are there any other rivers? Why that river? It's dirty. I don't want to go in that river. Can I do something? Naaman, how desperate are you? Are you really that desperate? I wonder God's word to you is, how desperate are you? Are you really that desperate? Transformation entails not just humility. Transformation often requires us to do what we don't want to do. And this is a hard word. Transformation it often requires us to do what we don't want to do. Naaman wants a quick solution. Can you just come out here and wave your hand? Or can I get into some nicer waters? And the answer is no. Seven times in the Jordan, dip. Dip again. Now I get it. The Jordan River is dirty. Who wants to go into dirty water? Over the summer, I spent my time in a number of pools on my sabbatical. I was swimming, having a great time. And in one occasion, I saw about an eight-year-old child swallow some water and then throw up all up in the pool. Nasty, just, just nasty. <laughs> and you should have seen people run out of the pool. It's like someone said, there's a shark. Everyone was just, they saw it and they just ran out. Why? Because who wants to do the backstroke in, in, in the middle of some nastiness? No one does. And so I don't fault Naaman. That's dirty. But, but, but his servant says, if he asked you to do something magnificent, you would have done it. He's just asking you to get wet. Can you get wet, Naaman? And Naaman decides to do what he doesn't want to do. It's a fascinating thing when you look at the Bible because the story of the people of God is this. We often don't want to do things God wants us to do. It was Willie James Jennings, a theologian out of Yale University. He wrote a book, a commentary in the book of Acts. And this is what he says along these lines. He says, in the book of Acts, almost no one is doing what they want to do. When you read the book of Acts, almost no one is doing what they want to do. Every time God comes to one of his people and gives them instructions, they say, I'm not going to do that. I'm not going to do that. God, God comes to a guy named Ananias in, in the book of Acts. The apostle Paul has just met the risen Jesus. Paul is struck down. He's blind. He needs someone to pray for him. And then God comes to a guy named Ananias. Ananias, there's a guy named Saul. Uh, yes, he's the one who kills Christians, but, but, but forget about that. He's blind. I need you to go and lay your hands on him so that he would be healed. Ananias says, I ain't doing that. He's known for killing Christians. I'm not doing that. God comes to Peter and says, Peter, uh, the, the word of the Lord is not just for Jewish people. It's for Gentiles as well. I want you to go to a guy named Cornelius' house. He has all kinds of like pork chops and all kinds of different foods and everything like that. And, and Peter says, I ain't going there. I never eat that before. I am not going there. Every time you see God come to someone, they say, I'm not doing it. Jonah, uh, go over there. Jonah goes the opposite way. He doesn't just say no. He, he goes the other way. I'm not going. I'm, I'm going the other way. And it is part of our story as well that when God says do something, we often say, uh-uh, I'm not going to do it. And yet transformation requires us often to do what you don't want to do. Here's the question. Here's the reflective question. What don't you want to do? 
What conversation do you not want to have? Where don't you want to go? Who don't you want to see? What don't you want to do? Transformation in, requires us to often do what we don't want to do. For some of us, it means being vulnerable. You want transformation to come? It means to be vulnerable. Not to everyone, but to someone. To someone you can trust, where you can say, this is what I'm struggling with. You want transformation? You cannot, you've been, you've been, why don't you, Lord, just wave your hand over me? In my bedroom when I'm by myself, can you just heal me that way? And God is saying, I'm, I'm not just after your healing, I'm after your transformation. Because you can get the symptom healed, but not have the root of it addressed. God is after the formation of our character. God is after the formation of our entire lives. And it, it often requires vulnerability. Naaman, are you willing to be vulnerable? Are you willing to open yourself up? For some of us, you know what this means very practically? Doing what you don't want to do? It might mean seeing a counselor, seeing a therapist, seeing a psychiatrist. You've been, you've been saying, can someone just wave their hand over me and pray for me? And God is saying, I'm trying to form something in you. I'm trying to form brokenness in you, vulnerability in you. For some, it might be checking yourself into a program for addictions. You, uh, can someone just pray for me? At the, at the, and, and yes, God performs miracles and God heals, but God is not just after our healing. God is after our transformation. And transformation means, will you be vulnerable? Will you be open? Naaman, will you be vulnerable? Will you be open? Will you be led by someone else? Will you let go of control? Are you, are you accustomed? Will you say yes to doing what you don't want to do? You know what this means? It often means sharing. I want transformation in my finances. Lord, transform my finances. But, but maybe the invitation is, why don't you share with someone how much debt you're in in the first place? And share where you're at financially. And not have shame to shackle you. Because whatever you can't name serves as the thing which you are in prison to. But if you can name it in the name of Jesus and say, this is where I'm at. My identity is not in this reality. My identity is in the love of God. Therefore, this is where I'm at. And when we can say, this is where I'm at, transformation begins to come. Doing what we don't want to do. In my own journey in following Jesus, I know what it's like to hold on to moments of pain, moments of just brokenness, and, and hold it to myself. And there are moments where if I experience some tension, I experience some conflict, a critical remark, uh, something happens where, where I go into a, a hole. And I remember seeing a therapist along these lines, a counselor, and for my own uh, growing in self-awareness as a pastor, as a preacher, as a father, as a husband, having seasons of therapy is really important for me. And so I, I found myself going into a hole. And a wise counselor said to me, when you go into the hole, oh, what do you do? And I said, I just dig deeper. I'm just in there. I'm, I'm, I'm just in there just wallowing in my own stuff. And he says, I want you to do something you don't typically do, a counter-instinctual practice. I want you to let someone else in whenever you find yourself going down a hole. And he said, who can you let in? And I said, I'll, I'll, I'll invite my wife in. And i never forget the moment where I began to say, in very simple words, Rosie, this is the anxiety I'm feeling, the fear that's having me go down a tailspin. This is what I'm feeling. And the sheer fact that I invited someone in, in that moment. All of us, it's not that I don't go into any holes anymore. It's just that they don't take two and three days to get out of anymore. It's just, it might, be, it, it might be 30 minutes now. But what, I had to do something that I typically don't want to do, which is invite someone into my own inner emotional world. Naaman, will you do what you don't want to do? Now, Naaman comes to a point where, where, thank God, he has people around him. Thank God he has community. 
Thank God he has someone who says there's a place to be healed. Thank God he has assistants who say, listen, man, he just told you to get wet. Why, why don't you go in? And Naaman, we all need friends like that. We need community who's going to say, why are you walking away? Why, why, why don't you stay there? Naaman decides to go ahead with it. He decides to get into the dirty water. And he gets into the water, and he remembers that the messenger of the prophet said, dive in seven times. And so Naaman gets in, and he dips in first time, comes back out, nothing. Second time, dips in, dips back out, nothing. Third time, dips in, dips back out, nothing. At this point, Naaman is probably thinking, I'm wasting my time. I'm embarrassing myself. Fourth time, dips back down, come back up, nothing. Fifth time, dips back down, comes back up, nothing. I imagine the servants are saying, please, God, heal this guy. Please, God, heal this guy. <laughs> Still nothing. Six times, dips back down, dips back up, nothing. Seventh time, dips down, dips back up. And when he comes out, it says, his, his skin is as soft as a baby's bottom. Just, just soft. Just, now, in the dipping down and coming up, in the dipping down and coming up, in the dipping down and the coming up, we, we see the third way of transformation, and it is in this. It's often the simple, regularly repeated acts of obedience that transform us. The simple, regularly repeated acts of obedience that transform us. It's often the little things, the little dip in and dip back out. Some of you say, God is not moving in my life. I come to church and nothing happens, but dip in again. You read your Bible and nothing happens. You don't hear God speaking to you again. Dip again. You pray, nothing happens. Uh, I'm tired of praying. Nothing happens when I pray. No, 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 no. But dip again. God is trying to form us through, through the small, regularly repeated practices. This is why when, when I get up in the morning to pray, there are often times where, like I said last week, nothing happens. Or at least I don't perceive anything happening. And I sit down and I'm distracted. I'm thinking about this and what someone else said and, and what I'm going to eat for lunch. And, and my mind is so distracted and I fall asleep. I wake back up. And, and, but, and, but, but, but God has taught me, keep dipping. You don't see it, keep dipping. No transformation, keep dipping. No healing yet, keep dipping. No word yet, keep dipping. Keep dipping. This past week, I was on my couch again, just opening up scripture, and I sat down. And most of the time, I'm distracted, but there came a moment, it was like the seventh dip for me, where I experienced something of the love of God. Something that's hard to articulate with words or write down in a speech. Something that I just know that I know that I know that I am loved. Love that is by a power that is greater than me. Loved by a God who sees me. And in that moment, it, it doesn't happen all the time, but I just sense the Lord say, keep dipping. The little practices. When we gather to church every Sunday, we're dipping. When we open the Bible again, we're dipping. When we pray, we're dipping. When we go to small group, we're dipping. When we say, can you pray for me? We are dipping. It's the simple, regularly repeated acts of obedience that transform us, which, which, which reminds me of a definition. I often hear that the word insanity is defined as doing the same thing over and over and expecting different results. And then I heard a friend of mine named Derek Vreeland, he's, he said that that's not just the definition of insanity, that's the definition of spiritual formation as well. Where you do the same things over and over again, expecting different results. When you dip in and out and in and out, you are positioning yourself for transformation. So, so, so stick with it. I know you're tempted to give up, but, but stick with it. Dip again. 
I want to close by connecting this all to Jesus Christ. Jesus' name doesn't come up in this story, but I want to show you how everything points to Jesus Christ and why we gather as the people of God together. Because many years after Naaman got into the water, Jesus would come along and get into the same water, the same Jordan River. And this Jesus would dip down and dip back up. But when Jesus dips in, he doesn't dip with leprosy on his skin. He dips as the pure lamb of God who takes away the sin of the world. But it is Jesus' willingness to identify with all the stuff the dirt, the grime, the sin of our lives. Jesus is not afraid of your your junk, your your, your sin. He, He dives in to take on your sin, to take on your dirt, to take on your leprosy. And he, and he dives in to take on our, our sin and so much so that he would go on a cross and be crucified, crucifying the leprosy of our hearts, crucifying the sin. Listen, Elisha could heal Naaman's skin, but he couldn't deal with his sin. But Jesus comes on the scene and, and deals with the root of the problem, our sin. That which keeps us alienated from God, alienated from our neighbor, alienated from ourselves. He would come and crucify that leprosy. And wow, because Jesus has come out of the waters, you can come out of the waters too clean. Whole, healed, renewed, restored. And it's out of trusting in this love of God who dips for us. And on our behalf that God now says, this is what Christ has done for you. Healed in his name. And out of his dipping, now you are invited to dip. To do that which you don't want to do. So that the ongoing work of transformation can take place in our lives. Amen. Let's pray together. Let's pray together. I wonder, what's your leprosy today? What's the pain, the anguish, the suffering, the ways that you have been in secret trying to solve the issues before you? Can you name it? Often for us, it's not a matter of knowing what to do. It's a matter of having the courage to do it. For some, it is about seeing a counselor, confessing some area of sin and brokenness to a friend, vulnerably checking yourself into a program, surrounding yourselves with a small group, There's so many different applications to this message. And I trust that the Holy Spirit is already prompting you and tugging you. Lord Jesus, on the outside, we often look pristine and just great. And yet on the inside, there's so much woundedness, so much pain. Lord, would you heal us? Would you transform us? Teach us to let go of our need to control everything, to do what we don't want to do. Lord, ground us in these simple, repeated acts of obedience that we would be faithful to you. And Lord, would you surprise us with healing and transformation? We sing to you now words of praise and worship. It's in Jesus' name we pray. Let's all stand together.
Let's sing that out. Here's my life. Have Let's lift our hands. Here's my Lord. Yes, Lord. Jesus Christ is the, the anti Naaman because he does what he doesn't want to do over and over again. He says, Father, if this cup can pass, let it be, the, let it be so, but not my will. Let your will be done. Faithful to do the will of God is our Savior. As we close, I want to invite our prayer team to come to my left, invite those who are going to take the bread and the cup to come to my right. Jesus does the will of God not just for us. Jesus does the will of God so that he can form us to do it as well. wonder what leprosy, what brokenness, what wounds, what pain. What are you feeling today? I love that chorus we just sang. That's the heart of someone who wants to trust God, someone who wants to experience transformation. Here's my life. Have your way. Let's sing that softly one more time. for your presence in this place, your presence that heals, presence that restores, your presence that renews. And Lord, this week, may we say, here's my life, have your way. Our prayer team is to my left, and for whatever needs you have, whatever struggles you're holding, you can't do it alone need the body of Christ to come alongside you. And we have the Lord's table for those who take bread that is broken, poured in a, dipped in a cup. Jesus Christ, the one who is broken and bruised on our behalf. The one who says, here's my life given for you. And as we come and take bread and dip it in a cup, we are reminded of the extent of God's love towards us. I want to invite you to open your hands towards heaven to receive a blessing. With your hands and your hearts in a posture of receiving, brothers and sisters, sons and daughters of the living God, may the Lord bless you and keep you. Make his face shine upon you and fill you with peace. And may you walk out of this building in the power of the Holy Spirit with the courage and wisdom to do that which you might not want to do 
what you know God is saying to do. May you relinquish control. May you open yourselves up to the repeated, regular practices of formation that ground us in God. And may God begin to surprise you with transformation. Transformation in your soul, transformation in your relationships, transformation at work. May God bring healing and renewal. I bless you all today in the strong, in the beautiful, in the healing name of Jesus Christ. And everyone said, Amen. Amen. Grace and peace to you all.